As far as I'm concerned, Dragon Quest XI is the first main series entry in the series since Dragon Quest VIII back in 2005. Dragon Quest IX was some medium-looking 3DS title that let you create your own character and had an emphasis on four-player co-op, and Dragon Quest X was a serviceable-looking MMO, neither of which possessed what I value most in my JRPGs, a rich, character-driven narrative. Dragon Quest VIII is one of my favorite games of all time, not RPGs, games of all time, and one of the major reasons why I still hold such strong feelings towards it is its long, intimate story. I mean, the hero's lover got turned into a horse for God's sakes. I mean, unless we wanted to move to Texas, Florida, or one of these other conveniently labeled states where bestiality is not technically legally actionable, we had a vested interest in our journey's conclusion. MMOs and other multiplayer-focused games, for me at least, never really seem to create that strong connection between the story, its characters, and you. Will Dragon Quest XI create that strong, exciting, emotional journey now that it's got the chance? I don't know, but uh, I've got my tissues on standby, just in case. Wait, no, 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 for crying in case, like, it gets really emotional, lots of sad ah. stuff happens. No, ah. no, 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 you guys, no, Boom. oh, you guys suck. <sighs> Our story begins as we explore a cheerful, thriving kingdom through the eyes of some chubby, uh, ghost thing? We see townspeople going about their day, children playing, hookers dancing in the street, you know, a perfect Sunday. Nothing could possibly ruin such a lovely... Ugh, f We see the 1% ominously discussing the fate of a newborn with a strange mark on his hand. Our hero. Before we really get an idea of what they have planned for us, our kingdom is set upon by a horde of monsters. With our mother and some random girl who I am absolutely sure will have no future significance to the plot, we flee the kingdom. Our mom hands us over to Girl of No Consequence and leads the pursuers away, sacrificing herself to buy us some time. Unfortunately, Hooded Girl here's got some butterfingers and winds up losing us in the river. Thankfully, buoyancy is on our side and the wicker basket carries us down the river Moses style to be found by this old ass man. How old is he? He is so old that by the next scene, he's fucking dead. Sixteen years pass in the blink of an eye as we skip over the drudgery of being raised in a rural village and pick up just in time for our hero's 16th birthday. As is custom in undeveloped societies, turning 16 means you have to take on some janky coming-of-age rite that involves summoning a sacred mountain to partake in some special prayer and putting your life on the line for no discernible reason. Accompanying us is Emma, our childhood friend and, no doubt, future lover. We arrive at the summit and are about to make our prayers when... BAM! We get jumped by some huge ass eagle we are not level to deal with. By all rights, we should be totally boned, but uh, lucky us, our strange birthmark lets loose some magic, cooks the bird, saves the day. After executing our prayer and making our way back to our village elder, we share with him what happened. We're informed that that birthmark proves we are the reincarnation of an ancient hero who once saved the world and sacrificed himself, transforming into the brilliant red star we see hanging in the sky both day and night. We're told that first thing in the morning we're to travel to the nearby kingdom, reveal ourselves to the local monarch, and sort out what our duties as Hero Incarnate are going to be. The entire village gathers to see us off in grand fashion, all excited for what the future may hold for them. All except Emma, who, as it turns out, would be particularly unhappy if we ended up trading in our sexy 16-year-old body for a gassy celestial body anytime soon. So upon making it to the kingdom, instead of receiving the hero's welcome we were expecting, we are largely met with indifference. We can't even get into the castle without being harassed by the guard, and the castle's open to the public. After producing evidence of our heritage, we are led in to meet the king, where we once again prove ourselves to his majesty, and he declares that the hero of legend has returned. Yeah! And, and, the hero is a demon child! Yeah, wait, 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 what? Ah, nuts. In true JRPG fashion, we're left stranded in a dungeon cell for all of uh, 30 seconds before preparing for our daring escape. Our cell neighbor, despite being locked up as well, seems to have a nuanced escape plan that includes... Wait, 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 wait. Did, did he just gut punch a guy in plate armor and wind him?
Danny Rand can take his whiny ass back to Kunlun. We've got a legit Iron Fist up in here. Anyway, we are treated to the most streamlined prison break I have ever seen in my entire life. Our hooded friend, not the girl from the beginning of the game, but someone decidedly more useful, not only retrieves the keys to get us out of our cell, he has also already dug an escape tunnel under his mattress. How long has he been in here? And, and the cherry on top? Before departing, he hears another approaching guard, ices him as well, then returns with all our gear. Now, this is a fantasy game, so I'm willing to cut it some slack. But holy shit, that is a heavy expositional load for a freshly introduced character to bear. Whoa. So we take our leave of the castle dungeons and end up in a surprisingly heavily patrolled system of catacombs. Naturally, we're spotted and we end up hauling ass out of there before being pincered on a bridge. As luck would have it, that very sturdy stone bridge that has likely stood strong for the past several centuries decides at that very moment to give under the weight of a small handful of people and sends everyone plummeting to their death. Uh, except for the two of us, of course. At this point, we seem to be relatively in the clear, so we- HOLY F***ING SHIT A DRAGON! RUN BOYS! DO YOUR BEST NATHAN Drake RUNNING TOWARDS THE CAMERA AND GET THE F*** OUT OF THERE! Jeez. Out of the frying pan and into the literal goddamn fire! We narrowly escape the flame-breathing death lizard that had no business showing its face this early in the game, make our way out of the caverns and get our first taste of freedom since... about 30 minutes ago when... Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Alright, screw it, let's jump! See ya! As one would expect, the story expands into a massive intercontinental journey that sees us searching out the secrets of our heritage, scouring dungeons for magical MacGuffins, recruiting a lovable cast of party members, and generally saving the day everywhere we go. Or doing our best, anyway. I know Dragon Quest is the aesthetic of a happy game where nothing bad happens, but uh... uh want, want to, uh, I'll, uh, I'll just let you see for yourself. Anyone who was disappointed with Final Fantasy XV's action take on the JRPG formula and was clamoring for a more traditional JRPG on a modern console will undoubtedly love Dragon Quest XI. Turn-based combat? Got it! An explorable world map? Pfft, why wouldn't there be? A plot so long and layered you wonder if it even has an ending? Still haven't finished it. Combat is the fan favorite, a line up and take turns shanking each other in the kidneys archetype, and I couldn't be happier about it. Your characters, of course, learn progressively more powerful moves and spells as they level up, and through unlocking them by using a new skill board. Each party member has their own specific board, each typically consisting of two to three weapon specialities and one to two specific character abilities. In addition to new attacks and spells, you largely accumulate passive buffs to stats such as speed, strength, and Sex appeal? Old school JRPGs have a reputation for erring on the more difficult side. Does Dragon Quest XI uphold this long-standing idea of difficulty? In a word, f You remember when you were a kid and you had that one friend who would invite you over to play Halo 2? They owned it and had a lot more time to practice so they were better than you, but they would go easy and give you a chance to learn how to play. You're doing some 1v1s on Lockout and everyone's having fun. At first. After a few hours, you start getting a bit too crispy with that BR and land one too many plasma grenades. All of a sudden, that sticky palm douche canoe starts controlling power weapon spawns, juking like a madman and exploiting, frankly, unfair knowledge of the map's geometry just to make you feel small and put you in your place. That is how I would describe the difficulty curve of this game. A spiteful 13-year-old only child. You call it this controller wasn't wireless, I'd strangle you with it! At a number of points of the game, some regular encounters proved more palm-sweatingly difficult than many boss battles. The sheer number of enemies that can bog down your party in status ailments is confounding, and on top of that, several enemy types possess the ability to call for reinforcements, replenishing their numbers faster than you can kill them. I, for one, found this challenge enjoyable most of the time, but I can imagine there are others who may not like the idea of a 15-minute run-of-the-mill encounter you're left hobbling away from. One aspect of traditional JRPGs we are all happy to see left behind is random battles. Mobs appear through the game's fields and dungeons and in staggeringly large numbers. They can be avoided with a little fancy footwork, taken head-on with a swift preemptive strike, or, if you're on your nice-ass horse, plowed straight over. 
During combat, your party members will eventually enter the zone state and will receive a modest damage buff as well as access to powerful collaborative attacks with other party members. The more of your party is in the zone at once, the more of your party can participate in sad attacks, the stronger those attacks become. These cooperative attacks do everything from massive single target damage to stack multiple buffs on your entire party, all depending on the combination of heroes. In previous Dragon Quest titles, simple tasks such as navigating the story could become an exercise in tedium if it was not made abundantly clear who you needed to speak with or where you needed to go. But thankfully, during my time with Dragon Quest XI, I never once exclaimed the classic JRPG question, uh, where the f am I supposed to be going? This is largely due to NPCs with pertinent information being clearly marked both in-game and on your map. This makes keeping track of quest givers a much more palatable experience. I'm sure we've all put down an RPG for a few more months than we intended at some point, only to pick it back up, load our most recent save, and have to ask ourselves, What the f*** was I doing? Dragon Quest XI addresses this by simply summarizing the most recent plot points for you each time you load up the game. Certainly nothing groundbreaking, but I have to appreciate the efforts that went into the small quality of life improvements. Traversing the game's beautiful landscapes and dungeons is made more interesting and more enjoyable through the addition of writable enemies. In specific areas, you'll see a mob marked by a gold sparkling aura, typically some sort of humanish dude riding a creature of some kind. If you kindly help said dude off his steed, you will be able to ride that creature around the map. In many dungeons, this is necessary for progression, but almost always these mounts grant access to items placed just out of reach when you're on foot. There's a fair number of minigames to occupy your time with when you're not grinding away at the main quest. Of course, the Dragon Quest staple casino makes a return, bringing with it the usual assortment of games to gamble away your hard-earned gold in exchange for powerful items. But more interestingly, Dragon Quest XI introduces horse racing, and oh my god, what a good time. You and three other randos go trotting around a track for three laps, you hit these green pools of energy to keep your horse burning, and of course, the first one over the line is the winner. There's a number of different difficulties and some sweet prizes for getting the best times. It's overall a very worthwhile addition to the game, and I haven't enjoyed drifting a living animal around a corner this much since... Final Fantasy XV. <laughs> Item crafting makes a return, but I'm not sure how I feel about it. In Dragon Quest VIII, your raw materials were real items that had actual utility outside of crafting, such as an already powerful sword and a metal slime crown. Put them together, and you're rewarded with a metal slime sword. It was a system I really liked because I was sacrificing things that had value to me in the pursuit of more powerful gear. In Dragon Quest XI, you collect random shit that is exclusively used for crafting, jam it into a magic pot, beat the contents with a hammer in an admittedly pretty interesting minigame, and out pops your item. Also, there is no more experimentation. You can't just throw some random shit in a pot and see if it makes something. No, no, first you gotta find the crafting recipe before you can make a given item despite having all the necessary ingredients. This system just feels like it's bandwagoning on the every game needs item crafting fad to appeal to the Venn diagram intersection of Minecraft enthusiasts and weeaboos. They want a crafty weeaboo to play this game? I'll give him a crafty weeaboo. His Kenjutsu is stylish, yet ill-informed. Master, forgive me. I've gotta go all out. Just this once. He is quick to correct your Japanese mispronunciation with his own. Ugh, it's Onagaishi Masu, not Onagaishi Masu, you pleb. Learn to speak the language or date ek. Means get the fk out. He claims to enjoy the flavor and texture of Nato. He is the biggest weeaboo in the world. I don't always dry hump a body pillow named Mikaru to completion, but when I do, I prefer not to dwell on what that says about my life. Stay weeby, my friends. Dragon Quest XI forgoes the more traditional cell shading angle for something I want to call cell shading 2.0. Everything still has that anime cell shaded kind of look, except there are no more matte or flat colors. Everything is textured. Honestly, I found it kind of weird the first time I saw gameplay footage of it, and still wasn't a fan when I started the game up. But after about five or so hours, it kind of grew on me. 
My favorite thing about Dragon Quest is that, unlike some other JRPGs, your entire party does not consist exclusively of Japanese supermodels. Our party boasts a colorful assortment of ages, sexual orientations, and varying degrees of shag ability. I mean, look at our hero! He is rocking the 1990s Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Nobody is waiting around to give future trunks here and his epic center part the old, uh, puff puff. <laughs> Apart from ladies who do that for a living. You know, guys, why don't you wait down here? I'm gonna go, uh, do some, uh, research for the, the, the review. Yeah, research. The environments found through your adventure are as varied as they are breathtaking. Everything from thick, rainy jungles and frozen tundras all the way to flowered covered meadows and windswept farmlands, each made me pause for a moment in admiration. I found the white sands and shallow reflective waters of one particular area so overwhelmingly beautiful that it led me to believe they made the game's art director snort the ashes of Bob Ross off a first edition print of Dragon Ball every day before beginning work. The Camera Observe the beautiful way these battles are portrayed to us. Those cinematic angles, the wide sweeping shots, the way you're shown exactly who's performing an action, and said action's targets so there is zero confusion about what's going on. Exactly what you were looking for, right? Well, would you believe me if I said this was not the default camera setup? Yeah, the game starts you off like this. Like this! A free, unfocused camera. Oh, and look, you can move around for seemingly no reason. Neat. Do you have any idea how lame the combat looks without the constantly shifting camera to make your flaccid early game sword swings look epic? I shit you not, this camera thing was almost a deal breaker for me. Straight up, turned the game off for two days to mourn before finding out there was an actual battle camera hidden away in the menus. The sound design is appropriately over the top. Nearly every action you take is accompanied by a crisp audio cue, whether it be the cartoony boing of your jump or the visceral ringing of your blade as you simultaneously draw your sword and slash an enemy for a preemptive strike. There's even the classic Dragon Quest audio cues for saving, sleeping, leveling up, and just about everything else you can think of. That being said, however, there is still the matter of the voice acting or lack thereof. Before games I'm really excited about, like Dragon Quest XI come out, I tend to keep my head buried and not pay much attention to any coverage they receive aside from basic promotional materials I can't really avoid. This meant that when our first cutscene started and the plotting of our antagonist was conveyed to me exclusively through subtitles, I was legitimately confused. On the one hand, they're really doubling down on making this game feel like a really old-school Dragon Quest adventure, so from an artistic point of view, I can completely respect this decision. On the other hand, Japanese is not my first language, and reading walls upon walls of text for 100 plus hours, with no voice acting to fill in the gaps of kanji pairings I don't know how to pronounce, or just letting me cruise through simple conversation without having to focus so hard on reading, was the language equivalent of jamming a catheter with no lubricant. Now, they may add voice acting for the international release, as they did with Dragon Quest VIII 10-ish years ago, but until anything is announced, I wouldn't get your hopes up. As I've said before, Dragon Quest works really hard to capture the feeling of an old-school Dragon Quest title. The music is exactly the Dragon Quest score you know and love. I'm no Dragon Quest historian, but I can safely say that over half the tracks in Eleven are arrangements of pieces found in previous games. It could be more, but either way, I hardly think it matters. These new arrangements of memorable tracks help the game feel familiar, yet still new, and I can't imagine a Dragon Quest adventure without them. In conclusion, guys, other than that borderline offensive default battle camera, I have practically nothing negative to say about this gem of a game. I enjoyed every moment of my time with it and intend to replay it and enjoy it many more times over the years to come. Dragon Quest XI cannot come away with anything less than my highest recommendation. This game is gold. I want to take a moment to thank Chase from Chase Face for loaning me his golden voice. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. If you want to hear him talk more about uh, gaming and otaku culture, there's a link to his channel down in the description. You should absolutely check it out. He makes high quality content that I'm sure anyone who enjoys my videos would also enjoy. And also that voice, though. Right? God damn. Alright guys, I just want to take a moment to thank all my Patreon supporters, 
In particular, I want to thank Tyler Rosardo, Sean Van Pelt, and Benjamin Montmoreau. You guys are my Patreon all-stars. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, if you're watching this and you'd like to also have your name featured at the end of my video or support the channel, go ahead and check out my Patreon page. I'll link to it down there. And uh, yeah, there's lots of cool rewards and stuff. There's definitely no obligation. You should feel zero obligation. But even if you want to support my channel just $1 a month, I will personally send you a link to Adblock for you to download and use with my blessing. Even $1 a month support from one of you is infinitely more meaningful and impactful to me and generating videos than the uh, meager YouTube AdSense revenue we're making right now, particularly now with sh sh like, of course, my Dead or Alive video. And uh, I make lots of videos about sexy things in Japan. YouTube doesn't like me. So your, your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, check it out. If not, don't even worry about it. You guys are all awesome. Thank you for watching. Thanks for watching, guys. Go ahead and check out my last review on Blue Reflection, a uh, kind of sexy-ish game about high school magic girls that may or may not be hit with a non-advertiser-friendly block thing, you know? But whatever, check it out. Um, additionally, here's a link to the entire Rainfall Review playlist if you're new to my channel. Go ahead and check that out. Uh, if you want to watch me stream on Twitch, I stream usually the, the game I'm reviewing next on there. Lots of Japanese stuff. Gonna do like a Persona 4 golden stream here at some point in English for you guys who've been asking. Yes, I'll start streaming some games in English. It'll be wonderful. But uh, yeah, that's everything. Thanks again for watching. In the meantime, I guess we're done here.